Dear God, we come to you this morning, God. We, we thank you for those who have fought so hard for the religious freedoms that we have been given today, God. The freedom to gather together, the freedom to worship you freely, the freedom to be here in a weekend like this setting and say you are Lord of our lives, God. Whatever steps we have forward, wherever we're going, God, may we be united in fellowship, united with you, but remembering those who have fought long and hard, given their lives, and the sacrifices that were made there. God, I thank you for this day, and I ask your spirit be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're talking about unity. Unity is key. In the days, in the months, in the years ahead, as we plan toward a new property, as we plan toward moving our building and moving our fellowship, we must remain in unity. That is the only way we can strengthen the body and do so. So as we start off this morning, if you'll join me by standing, we're going to read responsive reading 699. It'll be on the screens behind me as well as in your hymnal here. 699. I'll read the, the regular font faced and you read the bold faced ones on there as well. And we're reading about unity and the family of God. 699. How good and pleasant is it when brothers live together in unity? Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning... As I've told you already, we're talking about unity. In the days and the, and the things that we have ahead of us, we must stand united as a body of believers, as a fellowship gathered together of Christians and people who individually represent redeemed lives, but together become something of a lighthouse for this community and a lighthouse for our city and our state. We must start out united. There was an example given by Edward Dobson. As he, as he remembered this. Tonto and the Lone Ranger were riding through a canyon together when all of a sudden both sides were filled with Native American warriors on horses, dressed for battle. The Lone Ranger turned to Tonto and said, What are we going to do? Then Tonto replied, What do you mean we, white man? You've got to think about fellowship. You've got to think about unity. And we must stand together. We must have that measure of being united as we move forward. We can't say, what do you mean we? We've got to say, it's all about God and He will make it possible. He will get us where we're going. We have to fully trust in Him. The first thing is we think about being united as we think about that. Let's turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 really drink, brings home my first point is that we must be united in love. We must be united through love. Love must be the theme because greater love has no man than someone to lay down their life for their friend. And we know that Jesus did that for us. And so this love is here. It says in verse 14, it says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The perfect bond of unity. That is the place that it begins. It's a word to love one another as Christ loved us. His example, bearing our moral compass of where we should go and what we should do. And laying forward before us our biblical direction of how we live. 
So it says this, it talks about in the beginning, if we back up to the beginning of that chapter, it says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking those things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things here on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so, think about this. It has us to keep our mind focused, firmly planted, looking toward the heavens and knowing that God has a plan. If we've been raised up with Christ, our mind should be on that as well. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them aside, put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So we must have that unity. We must remember that God is in the midst of changing us. When we say the sinner's prayer and we call out to Christ and we have him come into our lives confessing our sins and laying that down before us, we put on Christ. He comes a part of who we are and he becomes a part of everything that we have. All the old things that we used to be a part of, the things that we have left behind need to stay behind. We need to press forward and look ahead. In this perfect bond of unity, in this perf perfect area, we must put on love which is given to us. Christ is revealed through us as we love one another. And as he's revealed to us, we begin to see that we are to put aside anger, wrath, all those things and not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self and have put on the new self who is being renewed. And all of that has been given to us who believe. Imagine this. If I were standing here today and I had a small flashlight, you know, one of the ones that clicks, you know, a little bitty flashlight makes no big significant difference, right? And this room went dark it wouldn't make much of a difference, right? You'd see that little light. You'd see me clicking it on. You'd see it come on and it would shine. But what if each one of you took your flashlight out and you turned it on? Now that would be a beam of light that not many people could say they could not see. That light would shine through those windows out into the streets because together we are better than we are separated. Together in unity, in love, if we allow God's light within us to shine forth from who we are, that kind of love is unmatched and cannot be touched in this world. Christ breaks down all barriers between us and everyone else. And it has to start within our fellowship. If we're seeking unity, if we're seeking to grow our church, if we're seeking to move to a new property, we have to start within ourselves. We have to be the lights that God's called us to be. And we have to shine forth in this world. But we have to love as He loved, putting on the new self and the new being and living that newness out every day. But another thing we have to have if you'll turn with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, we must have a humble attitude and a Christ-like approach to all that we do. There are a lot of plans and there are a lot of endeavors in the weeks and months and years to come in planning this new church property from from the plans that you have seen, the drawings that you have seen, the many countless hours that people have put into that. But there has to be more. We have to have a humble attitude and we have to be Christ-like in our nature. We have to seek that out. That has to be something that we intend to happen. If you intend to accomplish a goal, you need to strive to run after it. If you don't strive after the goal, how will you ever meet the mark? Or how will you ever make it to the end? In the very same way, we're reminded in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, 
Philippians chapter 2 talks about us being united in intent and purpose. It says this in verse 1. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Those two verses that I just read hinge on everything being united, on us moving in the same purpose, in the same meaning, in the same direction forward. If there's any encouragement, if there's any love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, same love, united in spirit, intent on the purpose. And here's where it breaks into the humble part of, of how to do this. It says in verse 3, it says, Do not, do nothing. From selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of, the, of those who are in heaven and those on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father forever and ever. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but with more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work with you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You know, one of the things that, that Scripture reminds us about, it reminds us about how less about us everything is. In this world, it's easy to say, well, how does my job, how does my school, how does my life, how does everything affect me? It's easy to lose focus and get focused in on things that are of this world. When our minds should be poised and looked heavenward, it's not about you, it's not about me. It's about God the Father. And what He's doing in and through our fellowship is something extraordinary that many of you cannot even see at this point. What He is doing and how He is moving toward a new property and a new beginning and a new start is going to give each one of us that hope and that renewed vigor that we need to have. But we need to remain steadfast in this. We need to do this without grumbling. We need to do this by being Christ-like and having that attitude. And it says here, it says, do these things in verse 14 without grumbling or disputing so that you are Prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Anybody ever read the news this week? Anybody turn on the television? Anybody got on a social media network? Anybody looked at the Yahoo page? Anybody seen anything? We live in a crooked and perverse generation. If we ever have lived in a crooked and perverse generation, we do now. We live in a generation that needs to see the hope of Christ and desperately needs us to step up and show them that. If we are united as a people in God, through Christ, for Him, watch out. Because it says right here, among whom you appear as lights in this world. We together can accomplish more than we ever individually could. Where two or more are gathered, there I am also. And I believe collectively, if our fellowship, our group of believers, our church stands united as one as we move forward, watch out world. Watch out Satan. Because First Baptist is coming. And we're shining bright into the future if we seek him first. It says that here. It says, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, nor toll in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I rejoice and share joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. We must hold fast in a generation that is crooked and perverse, in a generation that tries to tell us where we need to go and what we need to do and how we should believe and how we shouldn't bring our faith to the forefront of everything. 
We need to hold fast to God's word. This is truth. Social medias, networks, and websites will not tell you this. But we must hold fast to God's word in this generation, and this generation to come, and all generations to come. Because if it is not true, then we're here for naught. But I believe every word, every period, every exclamation part, and everything in this Bible was written for you and was written for me. Everything was written in here. Every time I read scripture, I find something new about myself. Every time I read scripture, and every time I read this, I know God is continually making me. And how I read it, how I read it when I was young is not the same way that I read it now. I know it's amazing. It's different. But when I was a teenager, I read it in, through the eyes of a teenager going through struggles, going through peer pressure, going through all the things that I was digging through when I was younger. That was the lens which I saw the Bible. And as I read it, it spoke to me and nurtured me where I am. And as I've gotten older, as a father, as a husband, I read God's word. And the same passages that have spoken to me then speak to me today. They are the true passages, faithful passages that point to an ever-loving and faithful God that does not leave our side no matter how many years we've been. And I remember too that in years past, my grandparents, my grandmother, we used to call her Mammy. She was my great-grandmother. And my mammy, now she could quote scripture, King James, quicker than you could probably pour a glass of tea. I mean, she could get God's word out and had everything to say about, hey, I know you're struggling through this in life, but God has a plan. And she would quote the King James Version. I think she knew every verse by heart. And she would quote that to me and she would share that to me and how profound and important that was to me that people would speak into my life and that others would help lift me up and my family and my fellowship and the church that I grew up in, they helped guide me through some treacherous waters and things, just being a teenager and learning how to answer things right and be right and do the things that I needed to do. And I'm telling you, if we're together, nothing can take us apart. Even though we face persecution, they say in this world, just as Christ faced persecution, we're going to have to deal with the same things, right? We're not immune to that. But what we are to do is to hold fast to his word, to have that humble attitude and Christ-like heart about everything that we do. D.L. Moody was one of the people that has profound things to say about unity, about humility. It says there are two things, there are two ways of being united. One is by being frozen together, and the other is by being melted together. What Christians need is to be united in brotherly love, and then they might expect to have power. See, the one thing we say is this as we're trying to live for God, as we're holding fast to the word, as we're loving one another, and we're trying to live as if He lived through us, we remind ourselves that He does not leave us nor forsake us. That if we're seeking out heavenward and we're seeking out God, that His power will reside within us. Just like Jeremiah was mentioning a minute ago I'll give you the words to say, I'll give you the things, and I'll put that on your path in front of you. I want you to be obedient and I want you to listen to me. I take that as an amen. So, um, but we want to be able to do that. And so, so we must remember that. We will have the power as we move forward for those who seek in unity and humility and through that to seek Christ. We must have endurance for what's ahead. That's this power. Philippians chapter 3, as we continue to read what Paul has said for us here. Philippians chapter 3 and we're going to be around verse 12 in just a second. But many of us have read Scripture, as I said a minute ago. Many of us have read Scripture over time. And how we read Scripture is drastically different in different stages of our lives. And as we seek Christ and as we know Christ, I know more every day that I have not arrived yet. You ever met somebody who thinks they've arrived yet? They're the biblical scholar that wants to quote everything to you and say, you know what, I come to church, I give everything I've got, I do this, I do that. And it's more about a checklist and more about let's see me than it is about you and that God growing together and knowing him. We have not arrived yet. I have not arrived. You have not arrived. We are all continually being molded and shaped into who God wants us to be. And if, we're, if we ever think that we've gotten enough God, we've gotten enough out of God's word and we've prayed enough be careful 
because he will knock you on your back and wake you up. I pray that today you're reminded of your need to stay connected with the one true God and to have that endurance for what's ahead. This passage here specifically has led me through a lot of days and I hope it will you too. So Philippians chapter 3 starting in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Thinking back to that scripture a minute ago, the old self, I've put on the new self. I want to leave behind what doesn't glorify God. And I want to move away from that. It says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything is in you, anything of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I've told you, and now I tell you even weeping. They are enemies of the cross to Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. We have to be reminded that it is not about our earthly struggles. It is not about our earthly things. It is not about what wealth we gain, the things we own, the people we're around necessarily. It is about a relationship with Christ and understanding that it has to be about Him. And it, and it gives us an example about those who are not, who are enemies of the cross of Christ, who fall into the pitfalls of this world. They read magazines, they read things and they think, this is how I should live, this is how I should be, this is what I need to do. And they think because they're not perfect, because they don't have everything right by this world's standard, that they're missing something. God is our standard. He is the measuring tool for our moral compass and everything else that we're looking for. Everybody over the years will say, I want to know this, I want to know that. God's already figured it out. He has already figured it out. And He reminds us that verse 20 it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform this body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has given even subjected himself to subject all things to himself. So we look at that. We look at that. We are to have endurance for the race ahead. We remember that, that God says we are not finished. That our work is not completed here. Until our final breath in this world and we wake up in the next world, our task is not done. As a fellowship and as a body of believers, we must be united. But we must have that endurance knowing that the days ahead are not going to be simple. But we have to look to God. We have to see that He has a plan for us. And we have to press on with everything that we have, understanding that, that He will transform us who follow Him in His power and in His glory. If we're submitting ourselves and following Him, He will transform us into who He wants us to be. And while we're here on earth, even though our citizenship is in heaven, we need to make a kingdom-sized impact while we're here on earth. It's not about punching a ticket and saying we have salvation. It's about leaving behind everything that God is about and making an impact even while we're here to say God was here, not Jeremy was here, God was here and He was relevant and He was real and He has truth and He has a meaning no matter what your generation is. I want someone that looks at Jack's generation, my two-year-old, and says to him, God is just as important ever has He ever been before as He is in your day. I want someone to say to us today and I want to say to you, God is ever important. If He ever has been needed, if He ever has been important to you, this is the generation that needs to take it seriously. Within our church, within our fellowship, we must stand united and have that endurance for what is ahead. Remembering that our own ways lead to destruction. But through Christ, we can be transformed. It's not about having this earthly body. It's about knowing our Heavenly Father. And it's big for us. So we need to understand that as well. As I find God's Word takes it a little bit further. And He also encourages us. In Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8. 
I'm reminded that we are to have blessed assurance that Jesus is mine and nothing can take us from the grasp of Christ. And as we think about how we should love one another in that unity and we should live in humility and have a Christ-like approach to everything that we do and how we should live, how we should raise our kids, how we should have families and everything that we do business from the way that we live to the way that we approach others and even united in this fellowship gathered here. We must have the assurance that Christ will never leave us nor forsake us, that he is always there with us. And the same God that's been faithful to my grandparents and the same father that's been faithful to me will be faithful to you and your family if you're willing to have that assurance and trust in him. And so we look at verse 35, it says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nothing. Just as it's written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things of present, nor things to come, no powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from Him. If we are desiring to have that personal relationship with Christ, and as a fellowship of believers, if we're wanting to be united, all of these things kind of have to fit in here. All of these things have to be given here. We can take a deep breath and understand that God has a hold of our lives. If we've trusted and called out to Him as Lord and Savior and said, I believe in you, confessing the sin that I have and knowing that you are Lord of my life, enter my life right now, save my life, Take my life, I give it to you. If we've ever prayed that prayer and invited Christ into our life, we can have that assurance that His love has a hold on us, that He has already conquered death. When Jesus came back after those three days, He conquered death. So we who are made alive in Him will conquer death too. He said, Behold, I've gone to prepare a place for you. If I wasn't going there, I would not have told you so. He's going to prepare a place for us. This is not our end place, our ending spot. Our kingdom is at hand. God is here. And that assurance we can take with us in the days ahead. A.W. Tozer is one of the prolific writers that we see today. If you've ever read his material, he can challenge you as well. He writes in his book, The Pursuit of God. He said, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow so that a hundred worshipers meeting together each one looking away to Christ are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be where they become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for a closer fellowship it is about Christ. It always has. It always will be as a fellowship as a unified body of believers we must seek Him in love. We must take a stand as a church body, united in love, with a humble and Christ-like attitude, enduring for Christ's sake and cause, and assured that we cannot be separated from Him. Now, if you've gathered yourself here today and you said, you said, Jeremy, that sounds like a mighty big God. And you don't know where I've been, and you don't know what I've done, and you don't know the road that I've taken. How can that God that you talk about that can love others, that can help us be unified, that can help us be humble, that can help us be that. I've never met that kind of God. And if you're here today and you said, I don't know Jesus Christ, that if he walked in those double doors on either side into this room right now, I wouldn't know him. I'm going to tell you today, there's hope for you. There's hope for you that sin wants kept us disconnected with Christ, with God. But in His great love for us, He sent Jesus Christ to die for us. That while we were still sinners, He died a horrible death on the cross so that we might be able to stand before Him. That if we confess by admitting all those things that we've done wrong, and if we confess that believing that He died and He came back from the grave, and if we trust in all of that, and that becomes a part of who we are, confessing that, He will enter our hearts and lives, and you can look at those last verses from Romans 8, we can have that assurance that nothing can separate us from His love. 
No amount of wealth, no amount of poverty, no amount of anything in this world we can do on our own endeavor will separate us from His love. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I invite you to come down forward this morning and come down forward and just pray with me because I want to rejoice with you. I want to rejoice in God coming into your life and giving you that assurance and that love and that hope that we all desire to have. But maybe you're here this morning and you say, oh, Jeremy, I haven't been the light that I needed to be. God hasn't shined before me. And as a believer within this church, I want to stand united together and I want to cry out in forgiveness and ask God to change my heart and continue to make me who He wants me to be. We have not arrived, everyone. We are on a journey together. And if we're moving forward... We need to remember that if you're here today and you desire to be baptized or be a part of our church, we would love to rejoice with you. We'd love to pray with you. In just a moment, I'm going to offer you a time to do that. But as we think about our choices and things today, I'd like to pray for you as Olivia comes up. Dear Heavenly Father, God, God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the powerful reminder that your word, your scriptures, your teachings... You, oh God, are enough for each of us. That God, if we're willing to put on the new self, love others as you've loved us, stand united through humility and your Christ-like love in this world, that God, you will give us the power and the endurance for the weeks and months and years ahead and the assurance of you will never leave our side, never forsake us, never leave us behind, God. God, if we're here today and we don't know you as Lord and Savior, as we sit here and contemplate our lives of being good enough or not good enough, God, I just thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, we can accept you as our Lord and Savior, God. God, if we're gathered here today and we don't know you as Lord and Savior, today we can cry out to you by admitting those things in our lives. The things that we feel make us unqualified to stand in your presence. If we acknowledge those things and admit those things, believing that you died for us, you rose from the grave for us to show your great love for us. And we confess all of that out, that you will save us, God. You will enter our lives, God. And that kind of love and that kind of relationship cannot be taken away from anything we accomplish in this world. So God, if you're... If you're here and you're moving this morning, and if there's one among our fellowship that needs to accept you as Lord and Savior right now, God, I just pray in the next few moments as we come down front, as we have an opportunity to worship you, as we pray asking forgiveness, God, for our lives, God, whatever our confession is, God, God, I pray we just lift everything up to you. It's about you, God. In the days and months forward, it has to be about you. So God, we pray now, if there's anyone that needs to know you, that needs to accept that or wants to change life. God, just move in their hearts to come forward. In these next few minutes, in your name we pray. Amen.